Okay, I've been asked to do a couple things, but I need your permission um, to, and to give you a little bit of information about me and the way that I think. Number one, you have to know some things about me. I do not think linear. And so it's really hard for me to actually make a linear argument. So I use Keynote or this PowerPoint presentation to kind of keep me on track. So if I come kind of fumble around with it, it's because my brain doesn't really go from A to B. It, it hardly ever makes those kinds of connections. So if at all, at any time, I'm not making those connections and you go, wow, I just didn't get that, it's my fault, <laughs> not yours. Two, you have to know about me. I learn best by arguing. Is there anybody else here that learns by arguing? Great. Then you'll understand. So whenever I am arguing about something, whenever I am trying to figure something out, it sounds like that I'm really attacking it. The reason I'm attacking it is because I think it's a great idea. And I want to find out more about it, not because I think it's a bad idea and somebody's stupid. So if I'm arguing with you, you should put your arms around me and say, he loves me. <laughs> so you have to know about me. I learned best by arguing. Now, this has not always played out to be in my best interest. <laughs> so I'm really glad we're not voting on the things I'm going to say. With all of that in mind, I'm going to ask you a favor. Anything that I say over the next 24 hours or so, give me five minutes. Just say to yourself, I don't believe that that's true. That can't possibly be true. It is so preposterous that it's not even the realm of truth. But just sit back and go, OK, I'll give it five minutes. That's all I need, five minutes. You can believe everything after that that it, I say is not true and is irrelevant and doesn't matter a hill of beans. But if you just give me five minutes for it to kind of sink in, wander around your brain and your heart and your soul, let, let it take in without really it kind of say, rejecting it at first, I'd really appreciate it. Because I actually, my, all my friends will tell you, I'm a lot more comfortable being wrong than I am being right. And so it doesn't bother me if people think I'm wrong. I, I actually see that as an honor, that at least I'm pushing the envelope to a point where people are like, that doesn't work for me. I'm fine with that. But if we can just give it five minutes to kind of get into a piece of us. Everyone agree? Can we take a vote on that? Should. <laughs> I think that maybe, for our purposes, it might be good to start in the gospel. Is this the right time up here? Yes. OK, good. Thank you. That's really helpful. We should start in the gospel. Now, one thing I want us to look at is in Matthew's gospel. Now, one of the <coughs> whole um, things that have captured my attention for the last 20 years and the thing that I've been researching most about is social economics. Now, social economics has hardly anything to do with money, although it does. It mainly has to do with um, how relationships, relational uh, connections, actually produce some worth, and what those um, relationships are worth, and how are they connected, and, and what makes them worth more or less, or any of those kinds of things. So that really has captured my mind, how things connect, and specifically, how human beings connect. Now, when I read the Gospel of Matthew through my lens of social economics, one of the things that you need to know about Matthew from my viewpoint, and again, give this five minutes, is that Matthew, Matthew's main issue is who belongs. How does Matthew start out his Gospel? Anyone? Well done, the genealogy. Now, why do you think he would start out that way? I think he's trying to piece the connections together. He's trying to say, okay, now if, if this is a family and if it's a family of God, who belongs to it? 
Now, one of the wonderful things about Matthew is he has no problem mixing people in who are a problem in the family. He doesn't, like, kick out the black sheep of the family, right? Because who shows up right in the middle of the genealogy? Two women. You don't do that in a genealogy at this time. Two women. One ha happens to be Rahab. Where is she from? Okay, and who's the other one that shows up? Ruth, and where is she from? Moab. Well done. I, I love it when people know, <laughs> know their gospel. So, all of a sudden, we have two people. Number one, because of their gender, should not show up in the genealogy. Number two, they are not Jews. They should not be there. So, all of a sudden, Matthew is already telling us by the way, this little family that we think is so squeaky clean and actually connects straight to Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is not clean at all. And, and it seems to me that Matthew wrestles with this question all through his gospel. So if you start reading the gospel with just that one thing in mind, hey, Matthew's trying to tell me who in the world belongs, who am I responsible for, who's responsible for me, then it brings a whole new light to some of his stories. One of those stories is right here, right in the middle, chapter 15, verse 22. So let's start out here. Just then, a Canaanite woman from the region came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly tormented by a demon. Now, there are two wonderful clues to the way what Matthew's trying to tell us about who belongs. One, where is she from? Does anybody see something weird about this already? There is no Canaan at this time. She can't be a Canaanite. What's he trying to tell us? This is an interesting mix. Matthew already has goofed things up. This is a Canaanite woman. What, did she come from the past? This was like, you know, someone beamed in from the past. This Canaanite woman just to mix the gospel up. So he sets this up. She's a Canaanite woman. That's strange. And then he says something about Jesus that tells where he's from. Son of David. Now, tell me a little bit of history in your own mind. What's a little bit of history about the Canaanites and the Jews? They were partners, right? They did a lot of things together. Best friends. No, this didn't happen. These two people do not belong together. So Matthew is already trying to show us something about the social connection between this woman who needs Jesus desperately and Jesus himself. Let's go on in the story. Yet he did not say a word to her. Now, this is not, um, this would not have been seen as peculiar. We see it as peculiar only because we know Jesus. We think, wow, that's really strange. Our Lord, the compassionate one, the one full of grace and mercy, who by that grace we are saved. Well, this seems really weird to us. This is not weird if she's a Canaanite woman. You see that? So it's only strange to us. But he doesn't say a word to her. So the disciples, because they're getting annoyed, go to him and urge him. Send her away because she cries out after us. 